Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all your faces. It's good to be back in the States. It's actually kind of weird to see you all sitting at tables like this. So if this is your first time here and this is kind of weird for you, just know it's kind of weird for us too. This isn't how we normally do this. So, um, so I w my family and I always have this habit when we visit a different church, we always tend to visit it on a Sunday where there's something odd going on, you know, like a guest speaker or something. And it's like, is this normal? And, or is it just us? So um, yeah, anyway, we're glad you're here. Hope you're okay sitting in uh, tables like this. But I want to thank all of you uh, who were praying for me and my family while I was overseas in North Africa for the last couple weeks. I uh, very much appreciate it. Um, as some of you know, the, so I was in the land of the Exodus. Um, and just even before the trip started, it didn't go as planned. One of my teammates got COVID and couldn't even travel. As we're in the airport, we were told that there were some security concerns that were going to keep us from visiting some of the places uh, that we needed to go, that we intended to go to. Um, but once we got there, we were able to shift things around quite a bit and bring people to us, which was kind of nice, yet a little bit weird. But, um, and one of the things that we were doing in this country was to do an evangelism training for these minority believers in the country. Um, and which is kind of a big deal because sharing your faith openly is not legal. Uh, and I asked them at one point, I said, you know, my impression of what it's like to be a Christian in your country is that if you were to talk about your faith, that you could be thrown in jail or per they're like absolutely like if we were to do this publicly we could be thrown in jail we could ostracize from our families we could be killed and yet they said but we want to learn how to do this because we know that jesus is that important um, and to hear that i mean those those people are my heroes um, because they have everything to lose by doing that. And yet there are times here in, in, in our country where we have the utmost freedom to share our faith openly. And I know there are times that I keep silent because I care whether or not somebody thinks that I'm a crazy Christian. So um, it, it, was, it was a really good and meaningful time. Um, so I, I do appreciate your prayers for us. Um, that country has over 106 million people, 90% of them are of the majority Muslim faith. Um, the other 10% are a variety of different Christian faiths, but maybe only 1% or 2% actually are what we would call believers. Um, people have given their life to Jesus. Um, and so uh, if anything's going to happen, change in that part of the world um, it's going to be those one or two percent people who step out and take the risk and 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 make Jesus known there. So please pray for them. And and as a lot of you know, I work with teachers uh, with the ministry I work with, the International School Project. And really, the idea is if you reach a teacher, they're going to reach the rest of their country. Because in some parts of well, and really in any country, you you may not have a church. You may not have Christian ministries, you're not going to have, you know, Campus Crusade or Athletes in Action or anything else like that, but no matter where you go, there's going to be a teacher, even in the most isolated version, even in like the refugee camps of Syria and other places like that. They may not be organized in any governmental kind of way, but those teachers will pull themselves together in those refugee camps, and they will teach. Because that's what teachers do, right? Those of you who are teachers, they teach. And so if you reach a teacher for Jesus, they're going to reach their students, and they're going to reach their colleagues, and they're going to reach the parents of those students. And so uh, that's why I focus on teachers um, working overseas. So again, uh, appreciate your prayers. 
Well, there's a lot more work to be done. Well, we're going to be digging into James chapter 3 today. And so if you have your Bibles, please open it and turn with me there. Um, and we're going to be looking about what God's Word has to say about our tongues. So as you're turning there, pray with me, please. Our great God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. This day that we could come out and worship you openly and in freedom. That we could sing praises to our God. And not have to worry about what other people think about us or what will happen to us or if, or if we'll be safe walking back to our cars. So thank you that we can come and worship you. And so, Father, in this sunny Sunday morning, uh, I pray that you will use this time that we have to speak to us. Uh, you'll use this time to challenge us, to encourage us, to make us more like Jesus. Um, and certainly as we look at this topic of, of our speech, of our tongues, uh, that you will... Teach us to give every part of our life over to you, to your spirit, so that we reflect the God that we know and that we love. So, yeah, thank you, Father, for this time we have, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, if you have your Bibles, please turn to James chapter 3. Uh, the title of our sermon series, as most of you know, is Hold Fast. And because throughout this book, as we've been studying it together, James is teaching us that the key to navigating life's challenges, the key to navigating its difficulties and its threats, and doing it in such a way that we don't give up, that we don't just chuck it all, that we don't set our faith aside. So the key to doing that is to hold fast to the truth of God's goodness and his sufficiency that is in Jesus Christ. And as we've seen in the first four or five sermons in this series, holding fast to God's goodness allows Christians to face adversity in a way that promotes maturity and God's glory. Holding fast to God's goodness turns those of us who are just hearers into actual doers as well. It also leads us to have kingdom-centered gatherings. That we don't just do church or do church a certain way, but we do it focusing on him and his kingdom. And, and holding fast to God's goodness produces generosity for the least of these, to, to those who are hurt or broken or marginalized. Um, and I, I don't know about you, but I hope you've been using our little study booklet uh, and, and studying this along with us. If, if not, there's still some copies out in the, the lobby out there that you can grab. But uh, I know it's, it's been a good thing for, for me and the times that we've tried to be faithful to do this as a family, to be studying this in advance and coming in and being prepared to hear this. So, um, yeah, if you're not doing that with us, I, I'd encourage you to, to study along with us throughout the week. But today we're going to look at chapter 3. And Noah, can you help me out a little bit, bud, and move me forward? Thank you. So I'm going to go there. There we go. So chapter 3, we're going to be talking about holding fast to God's goodness in, in such a way that it means that the only those whose hearts are governed by godly wisdom would seek or be sought out for leadership. So it's bringing up some of the 
the topics that he's already addressed in, in chapter 1 with asking for wisdom and the topic of the tongue as well and, and our speech and how that affects those who are in leadership and those who seek out leadership. So please stand with me and we're going to read through these 18 verses, which is the entirety of chapter 3 together. And Noah, if you wouldn't mind forwarding this as I go through so that I don't have to pay attention to both the slides and, and to the reading. But, so follow along with me in, here in chapter 3. It says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships for an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitterness, or if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about, about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. You may be seated. Now this section is uh, coming off the heels of James' teaching there in chapter 2 that our faith must find its expression not just in what we say we believe, not just in words, but also in our lifestyle, in our actions. And one specific example he used in that chapter was the issue of showing favoritism to the rich and casting aside those who are poor. And here, James addresses the issue, a second issue that is equally destructive in a Christian community. And that's the one of improper speech. So as we read in the first two verses of this chapter, James introduces this topic by discussing teachers. Uh, the concepts of showing favoritism and improper speech are related by the fact that they both have a negative effect on the church. And for teachers in particular, both can be a means of a, achieving some level of personal power and status. 
know, we're all familiar with those um, people in leadership or those who are pastors who are in it just for the recognition. Um, when I was first raising support to come on staff with Campus Crusade, I met with a pastor of, of a church in my town, um, and I asked him, all right, so hey, you know, you, you've been in ministry a long time. Why did you become a pastor? And he's like, well, it, it's got really good benefits. And I'm thinking, oh, he's making a joke, you know, like the, these eternal benefits, like, you know, there's going to be this great promotion in heaven. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I look forward to that someday too, and being honored by God, hopefully for a faithful life. And he's like, well, yeah, that's, that's true too. But I really became a pastor because, you know, I get so many weeks off every year. And then, I, you know, I get this, I'm like, wow, really? That, that's why you went into the ministry? Like, and for him, his reason for going into the ministry was because of the, the personal power and status that he seemed to get out of it. And for some of those people, cozying up to the rich and the powerful in the hopes that they might gain uh, some of their wealth and influence uh, is the reason that they do it. And that's certainly condemned by James here and then throughout the rest of Scripture as well. But likewise, as we'll see here in these verses, that teachers can use their words to hold sway over people. That they manipulate people for their own personal benefits or to steer them in a way that makes them, the speaker, the teacher, look good. Which is why holding fast to God's goodness means that only those whose hearts are governed by godly wisdom, would even bother to seek leadership. And those who hold fast to God's goodness uh, are the ones who are going to seek out good leadership as well. So let's look at these uh, verses a little bit more closely together. So if you're following along in your notes, uh, the first blank that you can fill in are these here. It says, the tongue is powerful. So we all know the tongue can be used to encourage people. Oh, man, you look really good today. Yeah. And you did a great job on that. I'm so proud of you. The tongue can be used to share the love of Jesus to those who've never heard. Or as... Some famous authors put it, tongue can be used to win friends and influence people. At the same time, the tongue, as we all know, can be used to criticize, to mock, to create enemies, to start wars. You know, in some ways it kind of goes without saying, because we all know this, we've all experienced this in our own life, but our words matter. Our words have consequences. Our words have power. And we have a responsibility, especially those who are teachers, to ensure that our words are true and accurate and appropriate. And it's for that reason that James starts off this chapter with a warning to those who may desire to become teachers. Because teachers will be held accountable for the words that they speak. In fact, we all will be held accountable for the words we speak. But as it says in verse 2, none of us is perfect. But teachers will be held to a higher standard. And really that's because the effects of their words, the wrong words, careless words, or even the words that are said in good intention, can have a much far-reaching effect uh, than others. You know, 
Maybe since James was the brother of Jesus, he had the words of his brother in mind when he was writing this. He could have been thinking of this passage here in Matthew 18. It says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. The consequences of our words that would lead people to sin are big. The Bible says it's better that that you're punished in that way than to lead somebody else to sin with your words. Or maybe James had in mind these words of Jesus. It says, And I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Or maybe James was thinking of the Ten Commandments. The third commandment says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, for those of you like me who grew up listening to King James, you know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And I often heard that that just was meant, you know, you shouldn't use God's name or Jesus as a swear word, right? You know, we hear that all the time in movies and, I don't know, maybe sometimes at home, hopefully not, but, you know, and that's what I thought that meant. But really what's going at this here in the third commandment of misusing the name of the Lord is those who speak on behalf of God. Like, you shouldn't in the name of God, say, well, you know, God bless you for what you're doing if that's not what God would bless what they're doing. You shouldn't say, speak on behalf of God any blessing or cursing that is not truly from God. In the Old Testament times of the prophets, There was always the harshest criticism and judgment for those who spoke on behalf of God when God did not speak or spoke on behalf of God saying things that he did not say or those who spoke on behalf of God who didn't say what God actually wanted them to say. Ezekiel 3, 17 through 19 is a perfect example of that. And I'd encourage you to write that down and look it up later. But those who are speaking, especially those who are teaching and representing God in that, are held to this this level of accountability. And we're all going to be held to, like I said, a level of accountability for the things that we say. But if we're saying it on behalf of God representing God in any particular specific way, then he's going to hold us accountable for that. And I'd even go so far to say that, yeah, that's certainly true for those who are up here or in front of classrooms or other things like that. But even those of us, when we're speaking with our peers, and we're saying this, you know, this is what God is saying, or God spoke to me and I should say this. We're going to have the audacity to do that. We should know that God holds that to a really high regard of whether or not that's true and that that's what he actually is saying. And while it's true of the Old Testament prophets that they were held to that high level of accountability, that's seen throughout the New Testament as well. You see warning after warning about false teaching, about erroneous or confusing theology and even warnings against outright heresy. You see it in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy 2, the book of Jude, and all throughout where there's warnings about those who are false teachers. And there are equal number of places that that talk about the responsibility of the pastor or the teacher of the church. 
Now Hebrews 13, 17 echoes what's said here in verse 1 of James 3, that your leaders keep watch over you as those who must give an account. So if a person is considering becoming a teacher, we should think long and hard about what if we really want to do that, if we want to be held to that level of accountability and, and scrutiny. You know, when I was fairly young in the ministry, I was speaking at one of our supporting churches up here in Springfield, and um, those of you who have been around Cedarville for a long time, um, um, Dr. Blumenstock was the pastor at that church. Um, and I had the, the privilege of, of talking about our ministry and giving the Sunday morning sermon at that time. Um, and I forget exactly what passage I was talking about. Um, but afterwards, uh, Dr. Blumenstock took me and Emily out for lunch. Um, I remember we were sitting in the Olive Garden up in Springfield, and he goes, you know, that was, that was a, a pretty nice sermon. Was, but that's not what that passage was saying. I was like, what? Sorry? He's like, yeah, he goes, that, that preached really well, and those were good words. He goes, but that's not what that passage that you opened up and said you were teaching out of, that's not what that passage was saying. He goes, and if you want to teach out of that, you need to teach what that passage is saying. And I was like, initially I was taken back by that because, you know, there was a little bit of pride in there. I worked hard on this. But at the same time, it humbled me. And I appreciated so much this, this man that I respected had the audacity <laughs> to, in a sense, put me in my place and say, this is what God expects of us as teachers. That if you're going to open up his word, you need to be faithful to what his word says. And that's true for all of us. So the text gives us three examples of how our words are powerful, how the tongue is powerful. And so let's look at just three of them real quickly. And I love these because they're just some very simple illustrations and very simple word pictures that I think any of us can get our heads around. And the first one is that the tongue is powerful in a way that it has the power to direct. And again, I think James is taking a page out of his brother Jesus' playbook here by just using these simple word pictures. You know, how Jesus liked to use parables and tell stories about things that people could relate to. James is doing that here in this first uh, set of them where he uses the illustration of a bit for a horse and a rudder for a ship. As we all know, a horse is a pretty large creature. You know, average weight of a horse is something like 660 pounds. And then you add a person riding on it, you know, it makes them even bigger and harder to lead. But, but a big animal like that can be steered even by a small child with a bit in its mouth. Not the child having the bit, but the animal, right? So. The bit in the horse's mouth allows the rider to control its head. And by controlling its head, you can direct the entire body. Likewise, a large ship is steered are directed by a relatively small rudder. They certainly didn't have those big giant cruise ships that we are familiar with nowadays, back in Bible times, but they still had big ships. And comparatively speaking, the rudder in the back of the ship is small in reference to the whole rest of it. But that little rudder, piece of wood or piece of steel nowadays or whatever, fiberglass that is back there can steer that entire thing. 
And the point of both illustrations James uses here is abundantly clear. Large, powerful, unmanageable things, like a horse or a ship, can be directed, can be steered by relatively small tools. And that's what it's like with our tongue. It's small compared to the rest of us. It's hidden away. It's often not seen. Unless you're my little kids who like to stick their tongue out. But, but our tongue directs our lives often. And although disproportionate in size, it produces big results. Think how much influence a person's words have over our lives. How a song or a speech or a poem can change the direction of history. How it can stir our emotions and our passions. How they can inspire. Think of Abe Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address. Martin Luther King in the I Have a Dream speech. The Winston Churchill and We Shall Fight. Think of Joshua in the Bible. And him saying, choose this day who you will serve, but it's for me and my house I will serve the Lord. I'm just thinking, think of the words of Ronald Reagan when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And how those words help direct the course of history. Of course, if you're like me, most of you know I really like movies, the words of William Wallace in Braveheart, which I won't do it with the accent, although I tried and I just wasn't getting it last night as I was practicing this, but fight and you may die, run and you'll live at least a while. And dying in our, your beds, many years from now, you will be willing to trade, will you be willing to trade all the days from that day to this for one chance, just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Now, I don't know if that was a real speech, but that was really inspiring to me, right? So, words have that kind of power to inspire us, to direct us, to motivate people. The right word used by the Holy Spirit could direct a soul out of sin and into salvation. Of course, at the same time, we recognize that while it can direct in good ways, it can direct in bad ways as well. Think of the various things that have been said throughout history that have sent people down the wrong path. You can pick the low-hanging fruit as examples for this of words of Lenin and Marx and Darwin. You can go back to the beginning of the Bible and just the words of Satan in the garden. You know, did God really say that? If you eat this, you won't really die. And just how those words shaped all of our history even now. The wrong word can direct the listener to the wrong path. An idle word, a questionable story, a half-truth, a deliberate lie can change the course of a life and lead it to destruction. That's why we need to be careful of pastors and teachers and leaders who are telling you things that God cares more about your happiness than he does about your holiness. Moving on, the second example of how the tongue is powerful is that it has the power to destroy. James uses a few more illustrations here. That a small spark can turn into a raging fire. And that there are animals that can be tamed, yet they're still full of, of poison. 
You know, when we're all little kids, we, we, we learn this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? We, we all heard that. Of course, we learn this as a as sort of a, this defense mechanism against name-calling and bullying, and, and it's intended to teach a kid to be resilient and avoid physical interaction and retaliation. But we all know the reality to that is not true. Like, words really hurt. You know, the strongest weapons that some people have in their arsenal are their words. That's why there are so many adults who are in counseling because of things that their parents said to them when they were kids. That's why there are so many marriages that are hurting and broken because of things that spouses say to each other, whether intentionally or not. You know, each year, many thousands and thousands of acres of woods are lost because of the carelessness of a camper and, and a campfire or cigarettes or something else like that that's just thrown out. A little flame can set a whole forest on fire. And the tongue as well as a flame. It can, through lies and gossip and, and heated words, set a whole family or church on fire. Proverbs 16, 27 says, A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. But James also compares the tongue to a fierce and poisonous beast that cannot be tamed. You know, there are many wild animals that have been tamed. You know, lions and killer whales, and bears and elephants. And, but the tongue, he says, can't be tamed. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. There are times we might think that we have our tongue tamed, but we're fooling ourselves. At best, it's like a wild animal that's housed in an inadequate cage. Eventually, it's going to bust out of it. Or it's like one of those performing tigers in a circus act. They may seem fully tamed, but eventually their true, untamed nature will come out. As certain Las Vegas performers found out the hard way. The Bible says that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It also says that the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked so that no one could understand it. So, our wicked heart is going to produce things out of our mouth even when we don't know it, expect it. I don't know, there, there are times in my life where, you know, my grandma was a good, godly, church-going woman that I highly respected. There, there were a few occasions where, like, Grandma, did, did that actually just come out of your mouth? Like, did, did you really say that, Grandma? Like, you know, every once in a while, it, that sinfulness in our heart comes out, you know, and how we criticize other people. And so even believers need to be aware of the sin that's in our hearts because it has the potential to come out in our words. The third way that the tongue is powerful is that it has the power to delight. Proverbs 25, 11, and 12 says that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And yet the greatest way that we can show delight is by singing praises to God, to worship God. Yet sometimes our delight, let's say, is schizophrenic at best. How often do we bless God in our praying and in our singing and then turn right around and curse a family member or pull out of the parking lot and have a little bit of road rage because of somebody cutting us off? Guilty. How many of us won't put a Christian bumper sticker on our cars 
uh, because we know that by doing so, our cars would then be producing two types of fruit. You know, our car would be saying on the outside, hey, I'm a Christian. But then the way that we drive it would be saying, eh, you know, I'm no different than you. You know, it's impossible for a fountain or a spring to produce fresh water and salt water. And it's impossible for a tongue to speak both blessing and cursing. Now, obviously, in that sense, it is possible that it happens, because we've all done it, but that's not the way that it should be. There's something wrong with the heart when the tongue is inconsistent. Proverbs 13, 2 through 3 says, From the fruit of their lips, people enjoy good things, but the unfaithful have an appetite for violence. Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. See, the tongue has the power to delight, but it also has that power to deride. Yet, as followers of Jesus, it should never be that way. And it certainly shouldn't be that way from your leaders. And it shouldn't be that way from the people that you seek out as your leaders. And if you're seeing that level of inconsistency in their life, in the way that they speak, you can be sure that there's a level of inconsistency in their life in the way that they live or in the things that they truly believe in their heart. So should we should be like what Hebrews 13, 15 says, that we should continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Well, the next thing that you can fill in there on your notes is just this application of wisdom. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly for the sake of time. But, but James indicates that there are two sources of wisdom and that the believer needs to really be discerning about where this wisdom is coming from. The tongue of the believer can be filled with true wisdom from above or false wisdom from below. So in verses 14 through 16, it talks about the false wisdom. That when we have bitterness and envy in our hearts, our tongues will express bitterness and envy. It'll come out in that way. And it doesn't matter how spiritual or how Christian our, our teaching may sound. If our speech is not controlled by the Holy Spirit, then we're passing on false wisdom. And, you know, we often recognize that this such false wisdom contradicts the Bible. But as it says there in verse, verse, verse 15, false wisdom belongs to the world. It's earthly. It belongs to the flesh. It's unspiritual. And in fact, it's satanic. It's of the devil. You know, we can always tell a church or a family that follows false wisdom. Because in that you'll find jealousy and confusion and division. Instead of humility and, and dependence upon the Holy Spirit and God's word. But on the other hand, true wisdom comes from above. It's verses 17 and 18. You know, we shouldn't have to advertise whether or not we're wise. I mean, if we truly were wise, it would be evident. It would be seen in how we express ourselves. It would be seen in how we speak, how we live humble and holy lives. This kind of wisdom comes from God by the Holy Spirit. It's not invented by man. It's not comes from any source of 
personal revelation. It's not your best life now because I figured it out. It comes from God and his word. True wisdom is pure. There's no error. It's peaceable. It leads to peace and harmony. It's gentle. Patience. It's all the fruit of the Spirit. And when the flesh controls the tongue, it unleashes a whole world of words that have no self-control, no willingness to listen to others. It's just out of control. The wise person uses gentleness and persuasion with patience. The wise person doesn't threaten or accuse, but is full of mercy and not quick to judge or condemn. So if, if we have this thing in us that is awful and it can't be controlled or tamed, what are we supposed to do about it? Like, should we just give up? I mean, if it's so restless and unruly that, and so that it can't be ruled, is there any hope? Should we just not try? Should we all go become monks and take a vow of silence? Should we sew our mouths shut and never say anything? You know, my mom threatened that to me a bunch of times when I was little. Maybe for some of us that might be a good idea, right? Um, at least the, maybe the vow of silence part, but... No, no, we, we look to God, we look to the Holy Spirit to tame the untamable. And that's what this last section in your notes is getting at. You know, St. Augustine wrote this, or maybe St. Augustine, depending on how you want to pr- pronounce his name. But when the tongue is tamed, what we're doing is we're confessing that it is brought about by the pity, the help, and the grace of God. That if we can tame our tongue, it's because it is by the grace of God. So how do we go about attempting, even attempting, to tame our tongue? I'm just going to put these all up here relatively quickly so you can jot them down and as I wrap up here. But the first thing we do is we have to be intentional about it. You know, we don't get muscles by not going to the gym or by not working out. We don't lose weight by ignoring the types of food that we eat. I know, I've tried that. It doesn't work. We don't have good relationships by ignoring things. All those things happen because we're intentional with them. And the same is true with our tongue. We have to be intentional on thinking about the words that we say and how we say them. The second thing is that we dedicate our hearts, our minds, and our tongues to the Lord every day. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about that we present our bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable unto God. And that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we're not to be conformed to this world, not to talk like and act like the rest of the world, but we're to be transformed by renewing our minds. Giving ourselves over to the Holy Spirit in every area. And we pray, and we pray a lot. (laughs) We pray that God will give us an awareness of our words. 